happens now with much less frequency. And I think it's probably related to what you said about labor. And that is, in those five very uncomfortable years of Corbyn did raise awareness everywhere um, of in, what... In, in the UK. In the UK of anti-Semitism and particularly its left form, its left variant, and what some of the anti-Jewish tropes that would be obvious and familiar to somebody like you or to somebody like me, which to a lot of people they weren't really completely aware of. And it was, you know, um, it was a painful process, but there was a kind of re-educate or crash course uh, that was offered by the Corbyn period, which meant that people suddenly realized that yes, it isn't good to hold a Jew living in London or Berlin or Paris responsible for the actions of a government thousands of miles away. That it isn't right to uh, link uh, conduct of the Israeli government with, you know, with metaphors or language associated with Judaism, hence chosen people or the wrath of Moses, a phrase that once appeared in The Independent. This is bad, you know, not, not, not the way to do it, that it is not legitimate to compare Israel to Nazism, etc. And each one of those came up about Corbyn and Labour. And in the process, as The Guardian was reporting on them, I think probably what happened is individual reporters, writers, sub-editors, editors thought, oh, right, now we know that you're, it's not really great to do that, so we're going to be a bit more careful. I, I, I think probably these things are about a wider culture than just one newspaper or even one political party. They are about the broader left, broadly defined across you know, many countries. And anti-Semitism on the left was something about which Jews knew a, a lot, but um, people who are not steeped in this didn't know so much. Yeah. So that's how I would link those two questions you've raised. I think you know the, the Guardian who came under severe criticism in the past and much less so now, I think at the time a lot of that criticism was unwarranted. Where I felt it was warranted, I agreed with it and joined it publicly. Uh, these days, perhaps much less, because people have had a bit of an education in how anti-Semitism works. And particularly, as I say, people who didn't believe that people who were anti-racist could also harbour anti-Semitic attitudes. I think a lot of people found that fascinating that Jeremy Corbyn would say, of course I'm not, I'm an anti-racist, believing that must end the argument. And what Jews were able to do is to say that people who are who imagine themselves to be tremendously progressive uh, figures, if they believe their job in life is to attack power, and if they have swallowed the anti-Semitic canard that Jews are power, they will then themselves lurch into anti-Semitic framing. And that was something I think a lot of people didn't really realize before. But you know, even today, there's right now a big uh, debate going on about statues of disagreeable people. You have a uh, Famously, uh, the statue of the in Bristol of a slave uh, trade slave owner called Edward Coulson was toppled down and thrown into the, the lake or canal there, and uh, there now uh, a big petition to remove all kinds of statues. Just yesterday, Rhodes, as in the Rhodes Scholarships, as in Bill Clinton, and so on at Oxford, Oxford University, they're going to take down. I can't remember if it's a busk or a statue or plaque of Rhodes himself. Um, and, you know, on balance, certainly in the case of Bristol and the, the slave trader, I think it's a good thing that the statue has been removed. It would have been better if it had been done peacefully rather than, by, sort of, you know, by a group just taking the law into their own hands. But never mind, I think it's probably a good thing that's come down. But now we're in a situation where, for example, there's a mass petition to remove a statue of Gandhi in Leicester in the British Midlands. It was only put up in 2009 by the British Indian community. And the petition, I quote, says he is a fascist, a racist, and a sexual predator about Gandhi. Now, I haven't studied the history of Gandhi, so I don't necessarily want to comment on that. What I will say is this, that if we start removing the statues, and this links into the point about awareness of anti-Semitism, particularly in Britain, there's almost, I mean, let's start with the statue of King Edward I to expel Jews, or right outside Parliament, there's a massive statue of Richard the Lionheart who slaughtered thousands of Jews in pogroms, okay? Or, you know, more recently, you know, 
I don't know where to, to end. You know, even people like Karl Marx, his bastard in Highgate, although he himself was of Jewish origin, he referred to Jewish vermin, and he said we have to get rid of this ill. There's no question that Karl Marx is the ultimate example of a Jewish anti-Semite. I don't even like the term self-hater, because he didn't hate himself, he hated other Jews. So my point is this, where you stop? Virtually every church and cathedral in continental Europe from the pulpit of that church has been some call to go and massacre Jews at some point in European history. Are we to tear down churches and statues and cathedrals? Are we to tear down the uh, pyramids in Egypt, which were largely built by Jewish slaves? Of course, my answer is no. But what I would like to have is more awareness, at least in the pages of The Guardian, for example, while not calling for the removal of statues which are offensive to Jews, awareness that anti-Semitism wasn't just in Germany or Poland. It didn't just start with Hitler and end with Hitler. It's a very long, drawn out process and indeed has a very long history, unfortunately, in Britain too. And I think the education, or let's say the Corbyn period and the British left, should and could be widened out to something across the political divide. It's obviously not just a left-wing thing. There's plenty of anti-Semitism among, um, you know, in the shires, and English conservative shires as well. Um, and of course, not just anti-Semitism. I was certainly not taught enough at school about the ills of the British Empire. We learned some stuff about the good stuff the British Empire did, and it, it obviously did do good stuff, but we haven't learned enough about what, um, what Britain did in the world, but also in England to minorities, including Jews. So I know that's my views on the matter. I don't think we should start taking down too many statues, but I think we should certainly know about the full context of who these people were, good things and bad things about them. I don't know what's your... Very interesting. I mean, the um, I've written about this a bit, and what the, the, the thing I was writing about was that it struck me as... Uh, a just in terms of the timing, a terrible diversion, because I was struck by the fact that in some places around the world, as an aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, they were talking about whether the chokehold should be a legitimate part of policing. They were talking about the structure of police departments. They were talking about discrimination in, in custody. They were focusing on tangible demands about specific police departments. And here, in Britain, we were straight away on to, was Churchill, does Churchill deserve a statue because of his statements and record on race? And it just struck me that if I was the police force in London, I'd be thrilled that I wasn't having to account for the discriminatory record of my department, but instead, well, let's have a seminar about statues. Mm -hmm. And it struck me as an example of how very often the progressive left can snatch uh, victory, defeat from the jaws of victory, you know, that they were, there was a moment there where the polling was extraordinary about what a consensus there was, uh, that obviously the George Floyd uh, murder was wrong, but also that, that racism is a direct and current problem that needs to be dealt with, and that there is a huge discrepancy in the death toll, for example, from coronavirus, black, Asian, minority, ethnic people are dying in much bigger numbers. Press on that right now, when you've got this window, and make demands on the government is on the back foot um, and, uh, and, and cannot make much of a case for the defence. Press your case. Uh, and instead, uh, it was moving on to territory where progressives and the left will lose because you will lose an argument about keeping a statue to Churchill. This country regards Churchill as its greatest ever leader uh, and, crucially, a figure of anti-fascism in the sense of he fought alone against Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich. So why shift ground from where you might win and where you actually can gain tangible gains to where you might lose? And it just, I, I felt the same similarly, by the way, about the slogan in the United States, defund the police. Now I know what they mean. They mean shift funding from, you know, by military style hardware for police departments and put it into mental health provision and uh, provision for youth and, uh, uh, and children in departments because not every hammer, you know, if you're man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If your only tool is a police department, then you're always going to criminalize every problem. I agree with all that. But if you make the slogan defund the police, what people hear is 
abolish the police and they think, well, if my house is burgled, I would like to be able to call 911 Something 999 and have the police. There are some now, in America calling for the abolishment of the police. I know they are, but that's but that I know there are, but that is to turn a winning issue into a losing issue. No question. Because because you, because you look at the polling and African Americans by huge numbers do not want to abolish the police. And the same for Latino Americans and older Americans and poor Americans. And the same goes through here. So it struck me as just the most uh, wrong-headed um, displacement activity and shift away from what you needed to focus on. And I, you know, there are many uh, lawyers, and but it's not just lawyers. There are many activists and writers, black lawyers, black activists, black writers, who've been making the same point. Let's stay focused on policing, criminal justice system, where we might win rather than on a cultural issue, a culture war, which in my view always favours the right. On your specific point about Jews, I think that is, it's interesting because you don't hear any Jewish person saying, let's tear down these statues. I haven't heard anyone say that, but I have heard them say, let's at least be aware of them. And maybe if we are going to talk about statues, if that is now the topic of the day, and I've explained why I don't think it's uh, brilliantly timed, but if we are going to get into that, then absolutely, it'd be quite useful to explain about Richard the Lionheart and the Crusades, uh, etc. Um, specifically because, as you say, people are probably not aware of the millennium-long history, not just of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. but specifically English anti-Semitism. One of Britain's gifts to the world, England's gifts to the world, is the blood libel, the accusation that Jews uh, you know, false accusation that Jews use the blood of uh, Christian or Gentile children for some ritual purpose. It's a total invention. It's, uh, I, I make a radio program for the BBC called The Long View, in which we look at the historical precedents for things going on now. And we did a program about fake news with the historical precedent being the blood libel in Norwich. William of Norwich, a child who was killed probably by his own family, in a in a child abuse case uh who which they blamed on the local jewish population of norwich a city in the east of england whose jewish community numbered at the time 25 there were 25 jews in norwich they said they killed this child and thus the blood libel was born and spread around england to lincoln and other cities and then to europe and of course resurfaced in a lurid way mm -hmm. in the nazi period so it would be very good to use this as a point of education why not you know what it, since they took down the statue in oriel college oxford of cecil rhodes yesterday there is a um they haven't taken it down they voted to say that it should be taken down okay well it, um, somebody just mentioned to me this morning that at king's college london there's an image of king henry the third outside and he banned the construction of synagogues and forced jews to wear badge which was one of the symbols which inspired the nazis the yellow star later so do i think the image of king henry the third should be taken down at king's college london i do not but i think every British school child should have at least a little bit on their school curriculum about this part of English history.